Oui, je pense qu'on peut commencer. Euh, bonjour à tous et à toutes. Uh, welcome everyone to this fifth uh, meeting, this fifth webinar of the Angel webinar series. Uh, in the future, in this, in this uh, webinar, we'll try to speak French for many reasons. Uh, I will explain in a moment. Uh, donc, uh, bienvenue à tous et toutes. Uh, Aujourd'hui, nous sommes particulièrement heureux de organiser notre uh, premier séminaire en partie en français et en partie en anglais, mais surtout en français, c'est vraiment un nouveau défi pour, 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 pour uh, Angel Network. J'espère que vous pouvez excuser mon, mon français, ce n'est pas très bon, mais j'espère que uh, Régis et, et tous ceux qui, qui parlent français, qui, qui écoutent, et vous, euh, vous, vous voulez apprécier l'effort fait pour communiquer avec une partie fondamentale des chercheurs dans l'éducation mondiale, le monde francophone, et parce que nous sommes particulièrement heureux euh, aujourd'hui euh, d'organiser notre premier séminaire et c'est un particulier plaisir et un honneur d'accueillir euh, le professeur Régis Mallet de l'Université de, 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 de Bordeaux. Euh, Régis Mallet est, est, est un membre, je, je, dirais, je disais, euh, historique du réseau euh, Angel. Et il est un professeur d'éducation comparée à, à, à l'Université de, 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 de Bordeaux. Et, um, professeur de sciences de l'éducation, il est aussi membre se, se, senior de l'Institut Université de France. Il a été président de l'Association francophone d'éducation comparée. Et, il a beaucoup de d'activités euh, académiques. Il est aussi éditeur du journal de l'éducation comparée. Donc, c'est un très grand euh, euh, professeur, un très grand euh, étudiant de l'éducation mondiale et, et de la, euh, il a particulièrement développé une approche politique et culturelle de, de l'école, de l'éducation, de la formation euh, sous, la, sous, la, sous, la mondiali sous la mondialisation euh, de, de, dans les champs de, de l'éducation comparée. Donc, nous sommes vraiment très euh, heureux et, et honorés d'avoir euh, euh, régie ici donc, dans, dans, aujourd'hui. On va euh, expliquer un petit peu comment, comment s'organise ce, ce, ce euh, webinaire. On avait euh, d'abord une présentation euh, du professeur euh, Régis Mallet euh, sur, le, sur le thème de l'éducation, la citoyenneté démocratique à l'ère du capitalisme éducatif. L'individuation de l'épreuve de la cohésion sociale, en anglais un petit peu différent, à propos, euh, euh, c'est en anglais Individual Social Cohesion and Democratic Citizenship in the Age of Educational euh, Capitalism. Régis, à toi. Merci beaucoup, merci beaucoup Massimiliano. Bonjour à toutes et tous. Uh, hello everyone. Thank you very much Massimiliano for, for, for your invitation and for the very kind words. Um, If you do not mind, I don't think you mind. I'm going to say a, a few words uh, in French uh, to thank you and to welcome uh, everyone. Et donc, je souhaite d'abord uh, remercier le réseau Angel et son coordinateur, uh, Massimiliano Torazzi, uh, pour cette invitation qui me fait très plaisir et qui m'honore. Alors, je ne vais pas en réalité trop parler en français dans le cadre de cet exposé. Euh, tout simplement pour m'adapter aussi à la composition de, de l'audience. Mais enfin, c'est un, un privilège, c'est ce que je veux dire, d'avoir la possibilité pour un chercheur francophone en éducation comparée de présenter ses travaux en ménageant le dialogue euh, interculturel, interlinguistique, le dialogue aussi scientifique entre nos communautés linguistiques et de recherche qui construisent euh, aussi, je crois, un rapport toujours singulier et façonné par une langue à leur objet. Et donc, euh, je vais adapter ma présentation pour que les, audita les auditeurs, euh, majoritairement, je crois, anglophones, puissent suivre, mais aussi pour que le, les collègues ou étudiants francophones présents 
le puissent également à travers un PowerPoint, probablement sont-ils eux-mêmes anglophones d'ailleurs, mais s'ils ne l'étaient pas, j'ai prévu un PowerPoint qui lui sera en français. So I shift back uh, to English now, uh, just to say I may occasionally uh, allow myself some French, as I've just done, but mostly I have to reassure a mainly English-speaking audience. I will use the lingua franca, that is English, supported by a power the PowerPoint in French. So the general purpose of, uh, of my presentation today is, is to consider um, how, by what means, and according to what mechanisms, over time and in highly contrasting political spaces, globalized educational capitalism uh, weakens, or not, the democratic foundation of uh, public education and fuels or, or, or frees or liberates through a global economic reason the anti-democratic forces of our societies. Capitalism's ability to embrace narratives and counter narratives, the ambivalence of a project centered on universal access to education for all and at the same time on priority investments in what is most cost effective. Altogether, this contributes to eroding somehow our democracies and weakening the ability of our national education systems to fulfill their missions of integration and social cohesion. How we can face and maybe resist this move will be considered throughout and mainly in conclusion. So, first point um, I want to, to stress is the forces behind the triumph, let's say, or the success of educational capitalism and its effects on our democracies. The question of whether capitalism supports democracy or contributes to the release of uh, anti-democratic forces is not a new one, either in education or in a broader picture in the regulation of uh, democratic life. First, we have to consider uh, the liberal moment narrative, le moment libéral. That is to say, capitalism seen as the liberation of energies and of oppression. Since the age of enlightenment, capitalism has long been seen as the driving force behind the liberation of what were not yet individuals, but would become so, with the emancipation of uh, an order, a feudal order, that did not recognize individual freedoms. And capitalism then became and remains for many, in this narrative at least, associated with liberation, with the construction of nation states, with the conquest of civil rights and with free international cooperation. This narrative, quite powerful, played a key role in, uh, in the promotion of education as a conquest of social justice, social progress, through equal access to educational goods. On the model of access to material goods, cultural industries, and consumption in general. So the first point is this, democracy and capitalism are thus, are then perfectly fitted in the minds of uh, its promoters. Thus in the field of education, capitalist domination was achieved against this backdrop of such a narrative of social progress, linked to the liberation of access to uh, conception, market, free market, free enterprise, but also, and we have not to forget this, against the backdrop of a struggle against the authoritarian, centralized economic in uh, statist regimes, which, uh, which are, have been since converted to capitalism themselves as we will consider attentively further. One of the keys are to understanding how capitalism has led the liberal states to deviate progressively from the social progress narrative promised by liberalism. As Thomas Piketty clearly showed 
with the fin financial capital? Is its growing cumulative and even monopolistic tropism? Contrary to the field or to the, the idea, the ideal of um, liberating energies, which is a positive, a positive narrative, a positive myth of capitalism allied to social progressive, progressivism within the framework of a healthy competition and against the rigidity of the state. The last century saw a cumulative process of capital captured by a few with a steady strengthening of uh, of conglomerates, of uh, dominations, of monopoles, deemed more economically sufficient, efficient than costful, even wasteful pluralism, even by the governments themselves. This reinforcement is achieved not through the differential quality of service, but through the primarily economic and financial capacity of a few to absorb, suffocate the others, to assimilate or convert them to their cause, in short, to destroy liberal pluralism for the benefit of the rulers, the monopoles. And as a consequence, this fueled the economic capacity of a few to influence and to shape the needs, the standards, and in short, to aim for standardizations of the goods to be sold, and consequently, for a form of standardization of social and cultural practices, and even ultimately, of standardization of users and consumers themselves. This is what the global economy is about now. And governments are partners in this cumulative drift towards economic domination. The point I want to stress at this stage is that, as we shall see, education has entered the dance somehow, if I may say, on the same false, falsely pluralist, social progressist, and economic, economic basis narrative. Maybe the big misunderstanding of liberal promises lie there. And again, the states have largely accompanied this tendency, notably with the roll back the state move initiated in, uh, in, the, in the 80s by the neoliberals. These laissez-faire policies you probably heard about, of course, have reinforced this cumulative and monopolistic tropism which can now be seen in all sectors of activity and for which states are no longer the real regulators, whatever they say, new technologies, agriculture, industries, health, for instance, pharma industry, but also cultural industries, leisure, and as we shall see, the education industry, if I may say, as well. This, mon this monopolistic tropism also dramatically increased economic power over the political one. And this indeed threatens democracy, whose survival always depends on the creation and the implementation of some political regulation instruments to pro protect democracy. So why exactly is, will, or could be uh, such a capitalism quite problematic for our democracies? First, because this global power has long exceeded nation states and nation, national policies in uh, the economic rational, which has, in a way, notably through uh, OECD actions, made of nation states, at best, the marginal regulators of the success of a few to the detriment of many. Second, because it promotes a conception of market regulation based on, 
what has been re called social Darwinism, theorized, as you know, by Spencer, which will produ progressively produce a certain conception of education based on the same principle of distinction or, or, or oligarchic domination, that is to say, that of the privatization of education, but still under the banner of social progressivism and under the banner of the adaptation, the, 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 the need for adaptation of our system to globalization, cynicism being part of the game, if I may say. But I will discuss this <clears throat> further. Then what is what does the cumulative tropism of capitalism promote exactly in education? First and foremost, uh, what I would call an ad hoc investment logic. When market power is accepted by the public authorities, by the politics, they direct their investments in direction of, uh, of what this social Darwinism produces, which in turn benefits the state, which spends more and more on those who do best. So the major indicator of democratic health is always this, the beneficiaries of public investment. And in this respect, the differential investment, which goes in the increasing direction of privatizing education and schooling, is of course counterproductive in terms of social cohesion and the democratic ideal. That is to say, giving more to those who have more to put it straight. The confusion between public policy and economic rational, or even its dilution, is somehow completely achieved. The bonus of economic efficiency leads, quite mechanically, mechanically to a reduction in investment in the populations, including schools, children, students, families, who need it most and on the contrary, a strengthening of the dominating power of those who have the most. And based on the responsibility, autonomy principle at the core of the ideology, the narrative itself makes individuals accountable for, for their success as well as their failure. So increasing inequalities, cumulative monopolistic reinforcement, problematic collusion between economics and politics, all this at risk of what we recognize as an oligarchic tendency in our societies. And this is the situation generally accepted today by educational states, which are caught up into the capitalist agenda. What about democratic education in this context? We will now look uh, at how the agenda fits into this movement but also presents its own characteristics and tension. From nation states to the world's play, space, from utopia to dystopia, the, the opposition and then conciliation between narratives and counter narratives. How educational capitalism has uh, recon reconciled somehow these narratives and to some stage weakened democracies goes with several stations we have to just point out uh, to remember first the time the momentum of the nation states i will go very shortly on this because this is well known before international organization which would never have seen light without them there was a first phase in globalization which is this momentum of nation states which began in the 19th century by borrowings, transferring, circulating of, of ideas and educational models. And in, in this crucial period of the construction of uh, publication, uh, public education and education states in Europe and beyond, comparative education has documented a lot this uh, worldwide movement toward a uh, internationalization at a time where modern states were being built on public education 
have both distinctive and interco interconnected one with, it, with the others. In fact, from this moment, the, the 19th century momentum, nation states, particularly in Europe, contained the seeds of their own overcoming as they expanded beyond themselves with the effects of the waves of uh, colonization. A second phase, uh, quite distinctive in the advent of this educational work space, uh, is this uh, international, what we call in France, internationalisme coopératif, what we could call um, educational internationalism, cooperative internationalism, pacifist in its foundation, promoted in particular, as you probably know, by the International Bureau of Education, which uh, in the aftermath of the Second World War became one of the major international organizations in 1945, UNESCO. This educational and cooperative internationalism signals the overcoming of national centrist, based, of course, of what happened just at the first part of the century. The, like uh, going beyond the state, beyond the, the nation, beyond its closed essentialist dimensions, preferring instead to promote the peace-building virtues of international cooperation, a universal common good and the rights of individuals. It went with the development of new causes that convey a certain idea of quality of education in education, accessibility, mobility, exchanges, language, prom languages promotion, pacifism, peace education, as Jean Piaget put it in these terms, uh, in 1931. And of course, human rights at the heart of this conception of quality education. Internationalism at this stage was therefore a, a transnational response to nationalism, but also, let's keep it in mind, an opening towards a capitalist conception of education centered on individuals more than on nations. A second a turning point to this second stage came in the very quickly in the 50s with the establishment of the UNESCO Institute for Lifelong Learning. From this moment, UNESCO, um, UNESCO um, started to carry out large-scale studies of a more economic, pragmatic, and even interventionist nature. From then on, annual reports were produced on educational accessibility, literacy, educational planning, uh, assessment techniques and instruments, teacher education, and a large collection of statistics in order to regulate the uh, supply and the flow of students, teachers, and so on. Uh, so this turning point gradually shifted from educational internationalism based on inter or transnational cooperation to a more pragmatic and economic interventionist, which was promoted by the OECD and other leadership and the initiative, actually, of the USA, and which gradually led to the denationalization and even the privatization of public ed education, a process which is still underway and of which PISA is a key instrument. With OECD, the, the USA's strong interest in implementing an international program to evaluate regularly Western education systems. For what purpose? Against the backdrop of the Cold War, of course, between capitalist and communist models of society. And this led to the creation of the IEA and promote a very large human and more and more inclusive model of education. The PISA assessments now involve not less than 70 countries, both members or non-members, uh, who are invited to share these human, human capital values, 
that guide the OECD program for evaluating systems and students, of course. As PISA's ambition, of course, you know, is not primarily informative, as we can read sometimes, but it is very much transformative. Its instruments, individual centered, standard states, standardized tests, performance measurements, and triennial assessment ranking in mathematics, science, and reading are designed to neutralize national contexts as relevant viable somehow. The reason of this lies in the very function of the, the instrument, which is not, well, which is to compare, of course, but in order to govern and guide public policy reform based on league tables in the direction of adapting educational provision to the needs of a globalized liberal economy. Recently, the French Ministry of Education called for a knowledge shock, which is part of a long tradition, just after the PISA results. This is part of a long tradition of successive shocks produced by PISA. The first PISA survey at the turn of the century was a shock in Germany, leading to cu curricular reforms. The PISA shocks contributed to an acceleration, escalation in standardized student assessments. In the USA, PISA was used at one stage to justify the race to the top program, which increased the use of standardized tests to assess not only students, but also staff, organizations, administrations, and so, and so on. So PISA contributes to this political short-termism uh, view through a three-year rhythm of its um, distribution. And this encourages politics to focus on short-sighted solution that will enable countries to move up in the ranking in the league tables without any real concern for the social, the social, societal, society roots of education, since the challenge in this capitalist model is to be competitive. So the economic rationale behind all this is somehow draining education in its projective, deliberative utopian somehow and ultimately existential function for democracies. By adhering to this tool, to this instrument, this kind of instruments, I would say op opportuni in a more opportunist than blind way, governments gave or have somehow given PISA the status of global jury of the means and the ends of education. This political renunciation to which PISA contributes through the league table style and fascination, this number approach of education inspires, combined with this OECD focus on standardized individual tests are gradually, let's say, stip stripping education of its substance, critical, deliberative, societal, civic-based, by transforming it into just maybe another element of measurement of economic competitiveness at the level of the nations and the individual. The stakes are very much democratic indeed, and they are high. So the magic, this is my third point, the magic of educational capitalism here lies in its ability to combine opposites. That's this magic. And to adapt to a diversity of narratives and regimes of justification. The, uh, the formula is uh, from Laurent Thévenot, French sociologist. Regimes of justification for the reform. Thus, while UNESCO uh, theoretical or philosophical framework of human rights sees education as an intrinsic right of each and everyone. The theory of human capital, the expression of educational capitalism promoted by OECD, recommends an allocation of resources that optimizes uh, individual and national economic productivity. 
the decisive role played by education in achieving uh, a greater economic productivity at both individual and a national level. But the magic is there, as reforms around the world have shown in our countries included. Educational capitalism are, has blurred the boundaries, playing both equity in terms of accessibility to education and the effectiveness of human capital approach to education. The main promoters of this approach are, of course, the intergovernmental organizations that have played a, a, a key role in the construction of a global education regime based on human capital and hyper-individualism, as I've just said. So despite contradictory, to my view, of competing philosophies and justification between, let's say, UNESCO and OECD, countries are increasingly adopting both types of educational reform discourse, and it's once again the the magic of capitalism to marry the opposites. The two reformist discourse, let's say humanistic, universalist, and economic, and more performance-oriented, though philosophically very distinct and even opposed to my view, are spreading into national policies at the same time. Europe is the most illustrative example of this astonishing alliance, and we find them in now in our national education systems, such as in France, where the parcours citoyen, the citizenship path, all along the school path, the education path, which combine all these ingredients tinged with slices of republicanism. This silence, this alliance uh, crystallizes in the centrality of the individual and no longer of societies or states in access uh, and uh, the right to education, but also in the ability to turn their acquired skills and knowledge into economic productivity. Where uh, societies and let's say collective structures of belonging, state, nation, culture, in brief, a suited, a situated common, prevailed at the aim and the horizon of uh, social cohesion, the construction of mass schooling, the individual became from the Second World War and onwards, uh, in the overcoming of society centrism, the primary and ontological ingredient of education in the global economy. So the myth, the mythology of narrative, the, the narrative, let's say, or uh, of solidarity between social progressivism, liberalism, and capitalism then reappears as a justification, but is it a, a, a proper one? In essence, capitalism aims to overcome the boundaries of states of societies, promoting individuals uh, and adaptability through education based more on power, on the ability to circulate, to perform, to make a difference, much more than to anchor, to embed, to embed it, uh, oneself into a culture. That's an evidence to say that. So the individual um, produced by capitalism is a monad somehow, exposed to the world with his or her capital. So in this context, fourth point, what are the contemporary challenges, les défis contemporains, for a democratic education concerned with the promotion of individual in a social cohesion. With the triumph, the success of educational capitalism, the trend is somehow to stop thinking, as George Gervich used to say, of society as the source of the law, including the source of the right to be educated. This is stifled by capitalism which instead of promoting pluralism, social pluralism, through the common law defined at the level of one society, defends more and more a naturalist, Darwinist, dominating vision of narratives 
In a libertarian vision of everything and anything consumed and regulated by a free market of narratives. A free market policy aggravates these results because individuals are left, are sent to the world with their own resources and public policy rarely compensates those who suffer damage, not treats even the causes of that damage. It may even find reasons to it. In this case, we easily speak of merit. The price of educational capitalism is nothing less than the fact that many people are poor and poorer today, so that a few can become in increasingly prosperous. And the acceptance of liberal states in the face of the phenomenon, that it was, uh, weakens democracy. The very extension of the notion of uh, human capital, which now includes various forms of employability capital, has another dramatic effect. It somehow absorbs the individual in an economic rational that exploits all the individual's resources, distinguished between academic, social, cultural, emotional, linguistic, entrepreneurial, character capitals, and no longer spare any boundaries between the professional, the public, and the personal or even intimate sphere of individual, the life skills, paradigm express this to my view. This form of uh, dilution of the individual in his or her educational path to the benefit of a community in which he or she is expected to be both performative, effective and creative clearly outline an hyper-individualistic conception of learning and success according to which the individual is called, is called upon to distinguish himself or herself through here, his or her added value, to have an added value. Yet, in a condition of the modern man, um, I don't know what the title in English exactly, but uh, Condition de l'homme moderne, Hannah Arendt, identified the Vita Activa, you remember, which is a, combi a combination of three fundamental human activities, labor, work, action. Aaron's principle is that no human life can be considered outside the presence or and relationship with uh, other men and without a co-presence with the world, but she is very careful to distinguish between the private and public in the in the in the human condition, the process. These are components of human life and the human condition. And this is, or it would be, very risky, indeed, in democratic terms, to dissolve them in the name of promoting an individual sent to the world, rich in all his or her capital, whether validated or not. So a capitalistic, holistic conception of education at the prison of uh, employability threatens to undermine the balance, this very balance between the public and private spheres into the individual's condition. The states are therefore really democratic. Public and educational institutions have an essential role to play in protecting these distinct spheres, uh, spheres of human life by uh, promoting, introducing a humanistic and civic dimension that promotes an educational subject who will base his or her action on chosen values. This is precisely where the difference lies with what, in a capitalist conception of education, can be more, and is, more oppressive than emancipatory for citizens educated and trained to make the demands of a globalized economy their own demands. So the magic of educational capitalism is the reconciliation of alternative, well, uh, I, I was saying, an archipel narrative. 
One of the dangers, too, of this archipel narrative, of this conception of education, is the collapse of the common, a renunciation to build one, the fragmentation of societies being no longer the horizon, well, the unification of societies, preferably, being no longer the horizon of education because of the competing, the organized competing of narratives, either adaptative, elitist, positivist, positive, vitalist, conspirationist, mystic, mythic, nationalist, and so on. All these narratives with the supports of storytellers in chief, new professions in sight, hired in both the private and public sectors. Every big cities in the world now have some storytellers. Such a market vision of education diminishes education as a societal and cultural fact phenomena. But even more striking, at first sight at least, but very coherent, and second, is another magic of educational capitalism, which is its widespread adoption, regardless of political regimes. As capitalism travels very well and cohabits very well with liberal and illiberal regimes. Let's observe what happens in India, for instance, where a curriculum of happiness was implemented, promoting well-being, active pedagogy, sustained development education centered on the construction of global competencies, closely linked to a curriculum focus on social participation and in the strong in the same move with a strong emphasis on patriotism national nationalism promotion mainly hindu a curriculum designed to train teach children both to be adapted adapted to globalization and and yet culturally and nationally rooted so there is the same focus on the individual but uh with an education which is placed not at the service of democracy, but the service of social and moral order. Still in India, Hindu nationalism rewrites history in school textbooks, and the happiness curriculum based on well-being develops when coexist in the same mov movement. Strong criticisms of universities considers ad anti-nationalist. In China, the movement is not far away and even quite close. With the promotion in the writing, the rewriting of history, school curricula, giving art and culture a function of strong and exclusive national affiliation, with the promotion of nationalism, historical heritage, while playing the same move, the full game of global challenges. I work myself with China for some time now, and I've been observing this very strange double movement, promotion of nationalism. And at the same time, a global rhetoric in education based on the promotion of global citizenship, diversity education. I myself led a summer school on this topic, social justice, sustainable development, and so on. Seeing the AGO promoted notions of global citizenship, critical thinking, sustainable development, adopted by illiberal regimes, that at the same time, this deploy a very strong moral order and very assertive, patriotic, nationalist value in a very assumed global competition is quite eloquent, to my view, on the traveling ability and the ambivalence of capitalism to adapt. The inclination to promote a moral order, to rewrite history, of course, is very well known in Russia with an exclusive, extensive, oppressive state promotion of the national narrative, supposedly inclusive of linguistic diversity, which is enormous, as you know, in Russia. But, uh, of course, you find this very strange rhetoric uh, project projecting the production of a Russian citizenship, which claims to be inclusive and, as and asserts itself beyond uh, ethnolinguistic diversity. 
But this fascination with moral order and a certain idea of authority against the backdrop of individualism is far from absent from uh, curricular reforms in the West. In the USA, we can mention book banning growing phenomena, which in recent years have taken a gigantic proportion in many states for well, various reasons I will not enter in, but uh, based on lobbying, a broad vision of moralism, etc. But also legislation, so the governments, local governments, banning the teaching of certain subjects, school um, materials from kindergarten to, to grade 12. In France, the hyper individualization at work in curricular reforms the gradual privatization of education and the temptation of authority can also be seen in the evolution of educational reforms, such as the current teacher training reform, where Republican values are present but compete uh, with a hyper individualistic and positive vision, which dominates in the curriculum of learning to teach. Why this confusion? <laughs> and why and how this affects public education. Let's try to comprehend why this educational capitalism blurs the, our reference points and sees a very, or augurs, a very worrying convergence between liberal and illiber illiberal curricular regimes. First, my view, because capitalism has coupled added value with economic competitiveness and put the power of narratives and counter-narrative on the same agenda. So relativism and the confidence to the market to give the rules expose to this. Why again? Because these share in common the fact that society is not the desired horizon of, uh, of, of the reform that what I said. So what's next, if there is any? The focus of an educational project based on human capital and the relentless competition between individuals weakened, weakens uh, the values uh, attached to the ideal of democratic citizenship in different ways. First, and mainly may, maybe, by creating internal tensions in our society that are increasingly difficult to sustain. Two, because by being solub soluble or adapti adapted to illiberal regimes, while I've just stressed, which embrace the same capitalist agenda by adapting it to a more nationalistic and authoritarian forms, which are their means of maintaining a national unity threatens, which is threatened in liberal regimes. And then, three, by a mirror effect, the dilution of liberal societies and the feeling, the growing feeling of injustice and social degradation of work in liberal regimes fuels a fascination for a large part of the population in our democracy for more authoritarian regimes that somehow console, consolate, I don't know if the term is right, but the economic and identity failures which... Uh, Exclusive nationalism and authoritarianism takes in charge somehow. Fourth, these phenomena are fueled by social networks, which buzz with these alternative narratives. All the harmful effects observed to date are exacerbated by social networks indeed, which are themselves marked by the monopolistic tropism and all the lobbying that goes with it, ma making it very difficult to reconcile uh, their success with a healthy democracy. What Mark Anderson 
identified as a suffering power of those who control the techno-capitalist machine, often through quasi-messianic figures, if you observe, celebrating the, the triumph of the dominant individual is another signal of, of this derive. This is also what Karl Polanyi identifies as an apparently paradoxical, but quite current, double movement that express for him, that expresses a growing and dialectical tension between a movement favoring the marketization of society with its lots of, uh, with lots of, of uh, uncertainties and losers and a counter movement aiming at social protection and reassurance of identity. In this picture, there's plenty of room for the discourse of authority on the one hand, and plenty of room for com competing regimes of truth, much more than the critical discourse of and truth shared and conquered through democratic uh, deliberation and public uh, education. In these tensions, and especially in this double movement, lies the threat to democratic citizenship posed by uh, capitalist education. Indeed, as uh, many uh, sociologists, demographers have shown, the continuing decline of the middle classes, of long decent paid blue collar workers, uh, who have been compelled more and more to take occasional dead-end, poorly paid jobs, all contribute to this. These ongoing forces have enlarged the class of capitalism losers and the objectives, uh, the objective collusion between the holders of the capital and the politics accompanying this process. And this has been reinforced the threats and insiders' defense, defiance, defiance to democratic regimes. Without even mentioning the massive phenomena of depression, loss of sense, burnout, suicides that we know about in, uh, in many liberal democracies under pressure. This leads to the development of a very painful feeling for the losers that they La that their lack of added value, which is quite uh, stressed by education, make them individuals with no market, with not market value somehow. This is the worst case scenario for democracy, that individuals themselves identify, measures themselves against this economic rational. But this is exactly to what expose what exposes capitalist education. So, to conclude, what can we say not to end on a low note? Well, to begin with, by saying that the uh, vitality and durability of democracy, which is both a faith and a belief, can only be sustained if the majority of people consider that is, the distributive effects of public policies are fair, are just. Without a fair policy for distributing goods, either material, immaterial, educational goods, and the opportunities that go with them, of course, the opportunities and the position that go with them, there is a painful awareness of a lack of recognition and dignity and democracy is weakened as a, as a result from inside. People suffering from a, a vivid, a very, very aware sense of relegation or injustice turn against the educated elites who divide somehow these policies and perpetuate, perpetuate them and perpetuate in the move their unjust effects. And these people in sufferance, more and more numerous, may be responsive 
at one stage to alternative discourses, as well to promises of an exclusive protective common, which would be closed to the turbulence of an open world. So that is to say nationalisms benefit from this moment, from the need for protection in an open world. And then we back to this second mood, move as it was uh, painted by Polanyi. Thus we need to take the measure that this uh, laissez-faire attitude of states in this respect has taken and, uh, and to become aware that the deterioration the deleterious impact of uh, wealth inequalities fueled by public education policies are very dramatic on the vitality and probably on the very existence of our democracies. And yet there are instruments, there are investments that would strengthen democracy that are not made. On the contrary, in which are in fact quite existential. Fairness, justice, social justice in the distribution of, of wealth is the crucial one. That's an evidence to say, but more tax justice, a better distribution of wealth, as uh, Piketty's work, for instance, point out, this is the first priority. A second one, a revaluation of incomes to avoid the continuity decline, the continuous decline of the so-called middle classes, which is very, very dangerous for our democracies. We have to reinvent re somehow middle class that are about to disappear. So re-evaluation of incomes in this direction. A revelation of the scale of symbolic and concrete, tangible appreciation, value of what I would call uh, prof prof professions of service, education, health, social work. This is no longer the priority and everyone knows. And this is of course just dramatic for social cohesion. And therefore, of course, invest massively and maybe I would say exclusively in public education for the children of low-income families, of course, but with and not alongside or away from um, privileged or high-income families. Because without social mixing in and through education, the very, the very idea of democratic uh, citizenship will remain a myth, a uh, disenchanted myth, and democracy will be threatened, its foundation being shattered and the ideal of living together too. And people are very much aware of this. The forecasts, if I may say, the agenda of our politics are quite alarming in this respect. I would just take the case of France to finish, where it's estimated today that in 10 years' time, more than 80% of uh, the uh, students, the, the children from the highest social professional groups will be, uh, will be uh, schooled in private schooling network. In addition to that, you have the rise, the growing rise of homeschooling. The one of shadow education, another topic that is uh, quite concerning. And these are expected in France, but in many countries, under various regimes, various political regimes. So all this is worrying, of course, for our democracies and for social cohesion. Capitalism, the end of which one or the other will announce regularly uh, the end, is much more creative, uh, adaptable and stronger than ever, alive and kicking. And governments are certainly 
not sufficiently interventionist in the fight against its deleterious effects on people. So I think we need to be aware of that and to be fair, to, to be uh, to be just as creative collectively, if we are not to endure without uh, taking action, what we know is happening to us, and even more, what uh, is happening to the most fragile among us. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Regis. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I, I really appreciate this very comprehensive and sophisticated analysis of the consequences of the educational capitalism in the current globalization society. I also appreciate uh, the, the, um, well, the, the role of, of uh, um, possible democratic education to, to, to somehow deal with this, this, this current situation. My question is about the <clears throat> the well, the topic we are more interested here in this in this top in this community so the the global education and learning or global citizenship education, and I'm wondering uh, what could be the role of global citizenship education in the scenario, the social and political scenario you highlighted, and especially is the global citizenship education a way for supporting and facilitating the, uh, the, 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 the so-called, what you call the, the human capital education approach, or on the contrary, it could be regarded as something that is contrasting this dominant uh, uh, approach, uh, educational approach by highlighting, I don't know, social justice, uh, human rights, uh, uh, equality issues, etc. So it, especially in looking at the the, the context you know better, for example, the France or, or other contexts. What is your opinion about that, about the role of global citizenship education, either in following or in contrasting, uh, to use the, the Polanyi the, the, the divide, uh, this scenario? Thank you very much, Massimiliano. That was the probably the, the most crucial question point of my presentation. I would, maybe I will I will I will because I didn't speak very much French and because you allowed me to 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 do it so and I saw some French people in the room. I I, I will try it. Uh, I will try an answer in French if you don't mind. It's okay. Alors, il me semble que uh, ce que je veux souligner et qui encore une fois fait partie pour moi non pas de d'une affirmation mais d'une d'un questionnement récurrent que j'ai. C'est la façon dont nous devons être nous-mêmes extrêmement attentifs dans la promotion de nos valeurs euh, qui peuvent et qui sont euh, euh, intégrées justement dans euh, le paradigme à la fois généreux, humaniste et universaliste initié par l'UNESCO d'éducation mondiale, d'éducation à la citoyenneté mondiale, à ne pas entrer dans la danse et dans le jeu d'un capitalisme mondialisé très accueillant pour la diversité des récits, ce qui lui permet de mieux les étouffer. Nul n'ignore que le poids de l'UNESCO dans la régulation des politiques internationales a décru depuis de nombreuses décennies. Au profit de quoi Au profit de l'OCDE Nul n'ignore que les États-Unis, qui se sont absentés à deux reprises de l'UNESCO à des moments clés de leur histoire, la présidence Reagan et la présidence Trump, peuvent demain, comme ils l'ont fait hier, s'en absenter de nouveau, pour mieux signaler que cette, cet, engouement, cet engouement pour euh, euh, l'universalisme et l'humanisme n'est pas à l'ordre du jour économique des nations. Donc ce que je veux dire, c'est que nous devons euh, veiller à ne pas contribuer à une forme de folklorisation, comme il en existe d'ailleurs beaucoup dans le monde, on va dire, euh, anglo-saxon, où on a un discours critique, 
généreux, mais finalement peu soutenu au-delà au des discours eux-mêmes par des politiques publiques tangibles. C'est pourquoi je partais de « pour mesurer la force démocratique d'un système, il faut interroger les investissements consentis dans ce système ». Moi, je vois une chose. Je vois que l'enseignement privé, quel qu'il soit, et je ne parle pas seulement d'enseignement confessionnel, fait l'objet d'une attention toute particulière de nos euh, démocraties libérales, que le processus de privatisation est en cours et que nous, éducateurs, intellectuels en action, comme euh, vous le dites, Massimiliano avec, euh, avec Carlos Torres, sommes pris dans cet agenda et nous devons euh, être conscients de cet agenda politique qui n'est pas exactement celui de notre agenda intellectuel et, 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 et des priorités que nous nous fixons. Donc, conscient de cela, il faut qu'on s'interroge sur les moyens d'action. Comment soutenir ceux qui défendent cela Comment, finalement, à l'intérieur de cet archipel narratif, construire des récits qui ne soient pas trop confortables, justement pour le capitalisme lui-même, ce que parfois l'OCDE, euh, OECD, euh, intègre très très commodément, très confortablement. Regardez l'évolution, il y a eu des études, il y a eu des articles de recherche extrêmement précieux là-dessus, qui regardaient l'évolution lexicale des rapports de l'OCDE et de l'UNESCO et qui voyaient un rapprochement, certes, rhétorique, mais qu'en est-il, encore une fois, des politiques tangibles Donc moi, ce que je souhaite et ce, que je, ce sur quoi je souhaite qu'on soit extrêmement attentif, c'est que ce qui nous est cher, qui est que les plus fragiles d'entre nous ne soient pas les laissés pour compte et les losers perpétuels du système, soient véritablement pris comme objet d'attention et sujet d'attention par ceux qui nous gouvernent. Et ça, ça passe à la fois par un engagement intellectuel et par un soutien aux forces progressistes qui sont prêtes à accompagner ce mouvement. Et d'être extrêmement intransigeant là-dessus, en prenant au pied de la lettre, en prenant au sérieux ce qui est énoncé par nos gouvernants. C'est ce que nous faisons dans, un, dans nos groupes de recherche, dans certains réseaux en France, que d'essayer de prendre le, au pied de la lettre des politiques publiques affichées pour ensuite interpeller le politique par rapport à la concrétude des actions menées dans ce sens. Le capitalisme est l'ami des récits et des contre-récits. Il est inclusif à l'égard de tous les contraires. Et donc il n'a peur de rien. C'est la raison pour laquelle les régimes autoritaires et illibéraux n'ont pas peur du capitalisme. Ils s'en servent parce qu'ils savent qu'il ne leur fera pas grand mal. Et le problème, c'est que la force cohésive par l'autoritarisme de société illibérale tend d'un miroir extrêmement, euh, comment dirais-je, humiliant à des démocraties libérales qui se trouvent en quelque sorte pillées de leur, on pourrait dire, leur capital économique pendant qu'eux-mêmes sont soumis à une fragmentation, voire une dilution interne de leur société, qui conduit certaines démocraties libérales à en aspirer à plus d'autoritarisme. C'est le monde à l'envers dans lequel nous vivons. Et c'est à cela qu'il faut être attentif. Nos démocraties sont de plus en plus soumises à la fascination de l'autoritarisme et de l'ordre moral comme horizon de l'éducation publique. Si nous ne prenons pas garde à cela, nous aurons dans les prochaines années, en Europe, en France, aux États-Unis et ailleurs, en Italie, des gouvernements qui s'appuieront sur les leçons des régimes illibéraux pour faire entendre, comme la Russie, comme la Chine le font, comme l'Inde le font, tout l'intérêt de, 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 finalement, de, de mixer une vision à la fois très cosmopolite et très ouverte au monde, dans une visée de bah, de développement d'un soft power hein, mondialisé et dans le même temps d'être dans une gande, une main dans un gant de fer localement pour développer une vision nationaliste exclusive de l'identité, de la culture, etc. Et ça, 
ça suppose un travail délibératif, projectif, politique, extrêmement sérieux de la part des démocraties libérales, soit à leur niveau propre, soit à un niveau intergouvernemental, et en particulier au niveau européen. L'Europe doit s'emparer de ces dangers d'une manière imminente et urgente, parce qu'ils sont tangibles. La fascination pour l'autoritarisme, combinée à la grande euh, adaptabilité du capitalisme économique, fait qu'il y a une confusion des genres et des régimes, des, des, des régimes politiques qui nourrit d'une certaine manière à la faveur de, encore une fois, euh, euh, l'archipel narratif euh, concédé par le capitalisme, rend particulièrement les gens euh, euh, comment dire, ouverts à des récits alternatifs, à un récit de vérité porté par l'éducation publique. Tout ça, ce sont ça les enjeux. Et nous, nous devons avoir une fonction de vigie, une fonction de veille, intellectuelle en action. J'aime beaucoup ce terme, Massimiliano et Carlos aussi, J'aime beaucoup ce terme parce que c'est ce que nous avons vocation à être, non pas sous la forme d'une approche partisane ou politique au sens politicien du terme, mais dans l'accompagnement et la défense de valeurs qui nous sont chères et qui sont chères aux institutions que nous représentons, les institutions dans des États démocratiques libéraux. Merci Régis, merci. Malheureusement, je crois qu'à l'Italie, nous sommes déjà à ce point, à, ce point, ou à peu près, nous sommes déjà là, mais il faut aussi, je suis complètement d'accord, il faut résister euh, avec le, le rôle des, des intellectuels, intellectuels en action, mais aussi, je crois que l'éducation de la citoyenneté mondiale, en, en certaines perspectives, l'éducation de la citoyenneté mondiale euh, peut être un moyen de, euh, aussi oui, de résister de cette... De cette, de cette euh, euh, direction. Tout à et, fait. Et a... Juste un mot en complément là-dessus, parce que c'est vrai que j'ai un peu éludé cet aspect-là, mais je suis complètement d'accord avec toi, avec un élément en plus qui est contenu, y compris dans ce, que, dans ce qui est fait par des, justement des chercheurs comme toi, comme vous, c'est euh, considérer que la question de l'éducation ne doit pas être cantonnée à la réflexion sur l'école, sur que l'éducation, euh, ce sont des temps de vie et qu'en fait la question de l'éducation à la citoyenneté Global, qui inclut des compétences critiques, des compétences analytiques, des compétences aussi à décoder le vrai du faux. C'est des choses que les démocraties avancées, comme par exemple certaines, certaines démocraties d'Europe du Nord, ont intégrées en faisant par exemple de l'éducation aux médias, qui est pour moi une partie de l'éducation à la citoyenneté globale, mmh. euh, des choses qui concernent aussi bien des enfants, des adolescents que des personnes âgées. Et donc, quand on, quand, si on arrive à comprendre que finalement, pour restaurer l'éducation publique comme un projet de société, il faut cesser de la cantonner à la seule éducation formelle, mais à la société tout entière, à ce moment-là, on avance. Et je trouve que de ce point de vue-là, la notion de citoyenneté globale et d'éducation à la citoyenneté globale est particulièrement pertinente. Thank you. Thank you very much, Régis, for your Thank you very much. excellent presentation. That would be very, it's it been very, 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 very interesting and uh, thought-provoking. Thought Uh, very useful for, for, for the future understanding and thinking and discussion on the, the impact of the globalization and this globalization on uh, uh, education policy and practice. Uh, before to, 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 to leave, uh, all of you, I would like just to remind you that the, uh, uh, speaking about multilingualism, the sixth edition of the Multilingual Digest has been uh, uh, published uh, this week. This week. Uh, the Multilingual Digest, as you probably remember, is a, is a reasoned by biography of uh, everything has been published in nine uh, European uh, uh, languages on the topic of global citizenship education, global education and learning. Uh, the Digest is downloadable for free on the uh, UCL uh, Uh, repository. I see. I saw that in the chat. The the link for downloading the the digest is available. This year, the, this digest is a bit different because it's more um, analysis of the current state of the art of publication, uh, highlighting emerging trends in research in different languages, including French, uh, and the, the 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 data. The, the the data are now included in the. GEL Global Education and Learning Database, which is also 
a resource uh, for free where you can check all the all the records of the uh, last 10 years roughly last last 10 years of of uh, uh, publications of, of publication in global educational learning so thank you very much thanks again uh, uh, reggie thank you uh, everybody for being here for uh, listening to this uh, to this uh, workshop this presentation yes and i'll see you on next appointment with this webinar on the angel webinar thank you, thank you and much. enjoy the rest of the day